and Post in Houma, Louisiana, oversees all the Gulf oil spill response efforts, from the spill site to the Louisiana coastline. C-SPAN was invited inside to tour the facility, where we spoke with top-ranking Coast Guard and BP officials. This is about 35 minutes. Welcome to Homa, Louisiana, in, in the Unified Command Incident Command Room, what we know as the War Room. This is the central room that is providing the direction and developing the strategic plans and op for operations that are driving 11,000 men and women who are working from the offshore source area uh, once fluids arrive at the surface all the way back through to the Louisiana shorelines and our efforts to protect those shorelines from any impact. This is one of the three incident commands that are actually designed to work collaboratively across the uh, Gulf of Mexico from Houma, Louisiana, which is responsible for all operations on the surface from the source to the Louisiana shorelines. The second incident command post is located in Mobile, Alabama and manages Mississippi, Alabama and a portion of the Florida Panhandle. And then there's a third incident command located in Miami which is focusing on Florida. Over these three incident command posts is the area command structure which is located in Robert, Louisiana just outside of Hammond. Coming in you notice that this is a BP building. What is this building usually used for? So in, in, in normal operational environment, this building was designed to be a training facility for our offshore and onshore oil field operators. It's a location in which we train, develop, and expand the skills and capabilities of the men and women who are involved with producing oil and gas in the operations. I see a lot of Coast Guard people here. I see a lot of people who are in civilian dress. Can you explain that breakdown? Well, under the National Incident Command System, this, is, this response has been developed as part of a unified command approach. And what you actually find in this building, as well as in our operations, is more than 80 differing agencies, companies, uh, individuals who come from literally all over the world as experts brought together to facilitate and support our mission here. Can you explain what all the different colored vests are that we see people walking around with? So under the incident command structure, there are typically four command uh, staffs that are supporting the overall running of the operations. There's the incident, unified incident command, which is the white vest that I'm wearing, and the staff that supports me, which is typically our public information and liaison operations, our safety operations for the totality of this, our legal operations for the totality of this efforts. And then what's the most important components of the incident command structure are the five differing groups that make up the body of this response effort. And they include planning, logistics, operations, finance, and resourcing. So tell me what happens in this room. So in this room, what you're seeing is uh, the convergence of the differing sections and their abilities to work together. So planning, which you see here uh, in the blue vests, are working to ensure that we develop the overarching objectives and priorities that are necessary to guide and direct our operations. If you look in the little bit further down, you translate our planning efforts into what then does operation need to do. And the, the group that you see in red uh, vests are part of our operations section. They are the people who are physically leading and directing what gets done on the water and on the shorelines every day to impact a, a success against the mission that we have, which is reducing oil on the water and subsequently reducing the potential risk of impact to our shorelines. It's a unified command. It is. Fat Allen is the... National Incident Commander. Right, and then underneath him, 
there are, like you would be someone who's one step under him? Or? Two steps under. There's the area command in which Admiral Watson, representing the U.S. Coast Guard, Doug Suttles, representing BP, and uh, a, a state representative for Louisiana, but equally in each of the other states, a state representative. So the Unified Command is made up of of those three principal parties, but it also includes representatives from the EPA, Department of Interior, uh, Bureau of Land Management, or MMS, uh, and it depends in, sect in, in incident command by incident command the relevant makeup of that unified structure. Ultimately, who is paying for, for all this? Well, the responsible party, uh, in this case BP, is, uh, is financing this response effort at this point in time. So everything that's happening in this building is financed by BP? That's correct. And how many people do you have here now? We have approximately a uh, thousand people that are working within the incident command structure, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you have both a day shift, working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and a night shift. The day shift is made up of significantly larger numbers. The night shift is usually when our planning and our detailed objective settings are developed in, to enable the next day's shift to hit the ground running at 6 a.m. Earlier I saw that you were giving a, a talk to all the employees. What happens at those meetings? Yes. It's, it's a great question. Each morning and again at nighttime, we actually gather as many people who can spare a few moments together to come in and we number one, remind ourselves of the mission. And that message we break down into four very simple tasks. Uh, first and foremost is to keep our people safe. Everything we do needs to be looked at through the lens of how do we keep people safe in what we ask them to do. Secondly, we look at it through the lens of at the source, how can we maximize and remove the oil that's coming to the surface 60 miles, 55 miles offshore approximately. And then thirdly, what can we do as it approaches when it comes past us at the source, and if it comes past us at the source, how do we respond in the 10 to 20 mile range offshore? And then if it comes past that line of defense, what do we do in the near shore and shorelines to respond quickly and to reduce or remediate an impact when it occurs? What have your days been like? Long, hard, but energizing. When you're surrounded by the caliber of people whose sole commitment and purpose is to bring everything that they know and every idea that they have and every idea that someone else may have that can be a part of the solution that helps us to improve on a daily basis. It is very energizing. It is very challenging. None of us want to be here for the reason that created this incident and the tragedy that, uh, that, that initiated it, but all of us are here with a commitment and a passion for doing the very best job that we can as a uni unified team to making a difference. Being the best source of information, working to ensure that we share information but we stay within our lives. This is essentially the war room for this oil spill. This is where we conduct our battle. Up here is our battle map, as you can see. All these people in this room are our war planners, and they're here for the fight. This shows you basically where the spill is at. All those symbols up there symbolize staging areas, decon areas, and the assets that we've deployed for this response. So everybody in this room that you see, everybody in this room is in the fight, they're planning the fight, and they're supporting the operations of the field. And we have the world's most renowned experts in here for oil spill fighting that it's unprecedented. We have veterans from Exxon Valdez, Costco, Busan, veterans from overseas and some of the incidents over there such as the Sea Empress and the Erica and they're all here to help us fight this, this spill. Uh, every day is a new day for us. Every day is a new oil spill as this continues to leak and we take it very seriously. Um, that's what's unique about this oil spill as opposed to any other oil spill we've ever had to fight in the United States is that every day is absolutely a new battle, which means new resources, new techniques, new innovations, new ways to fight for this cleanup of this oil so the people of Louisiana can get back to their way of life. But this is the, what we consider the main battlefront headquarters for this uh, response. This is where we basically develop the objectives and the goals to fight the oil spill. And then we also develop strategies 
we send that out to all our field commanders and uh, naval commanders and air force commanders that are out there so that they can carry out those objectives tactically. How is this unified command system working with the Coast Guard, working with private companies, you know, BP, how is that working? Right. Under the National Contingency Plan, the Coast Guard has, is the lead federal agency for the response to oil spills. In that authority, I have 51 percent of the vote, and therefore I am the authority here on the ground, here in Homa, for this oil spill. Uh, I've had this discussion with BP, and they understand clearly that I have 51 percent of the vote in that authority. My job is to make sure that they're moving in the right direction to take care of this oil spill. And I work very closely with Mike Unsler. But it, make sure you're clear or understand that we are actually directing under our authority this cleanup. How do you feel that's working? Okay. Uh, in our relationship with the BP, basically the Coast Guard has the legal responsibility for the cleanup of this oil spill. BP under the law has the financial responsibility. Therefore, we have to join efforts in making sure we're able to execute this oil spill cleanup. My legal responsibility is to make sure that they are proceeding in a way that this oil is being taken care of adequately, and we're trying to exceed that standard by making sure it's done even more than adequately, but to the best of their ability. They, in turn, are responsible for making sure that financially that they are mobilizing the resources, the contractor resources, the aircraft, the boats, the vessels, the people on the shoreline to make sure we get this cleanup done. I oversee that. I make sure that they're accomplishing that. So I've noticed that uh, there's quite a few Coast Guard post personnel in this building. About how many people are here from the Coast Guard? In this building alone, there's between 175 and 200 that are located here, and that's one of the things that I instituted when I took command uh, a couple of Fridays ago. It was clear that uh, we needed more Coast Guard involvement, more direction, so co that's why you see more Coast Guard here. Out in the field, for example, all the branch directors that are on the shoreline, that are running the shoreline operations, are all staffed with Coast Guard people in charge, with BP working directly for them and the contractors working directly for them to make sure that that effort is, is, is going along the uh, proper lines. We have Coast Guard people in, in all different kinds of positions and operations. We have really uh, uh, three operations going on. We have an Air Force operation, we've got air operations to do surveillance, to find the oil, to locate it, to actually direct the vessels on the water. We have a naval operation, right, for skimming the oil. And so we have Coast Guard involved with supervising that operation for skimming the oil. Uh, part of the air operations include aerial dispersants. Part of the naval operations include uh, not only skimming but burning as well. And then the other element is the shore-based activities we have. So we have shoreline branches, uh, shoreline operations folks to supervise the shoreline cleanup efforts that are going on in the field. One of my responsibilities is to ensure that we involve the local community in this response and that's a really big part of my day. So I maintain touch with all the Paris presidents to make sure that we have a unified effort going on in the field between the Coast Guard, BP, and uh, the, the parish organizations, because they're fighting this on, in, on their soil and on their ground, and we want to make sure they're included. Two nights ago, I participated in a town hall meeting. I absolutely insist that I be involved in those. I am off tonight, but tomorrow night I have a town hall meeting in Plaquemines Parish. I think it's important to meet the people, to tell them what's going on, to hear what they have to say. Um, I said to the troops this morning that this is not just a battle for oil spill, this is a battle for somebody's way of life. It's the way of life for the fishermen and the way of life of the people of Louisiana. And it, unless you put that face on the spill, you really don't know what you're fighting for. We're looking at our, uh, we call this our situation status map, and uh, we've got uh, numerous layers of uh, strategy or defense, uh, however you want to you say it, but we have the source here uh, as the red star, and uh, the red line is, uh, you know, where we've, we've spotted oil. It doesn't necessarily tell you the thickness or whether it's recoverable or skimmable. Uh, we have uh, overflights and um, aerial spotting, uh, satellite imagery that we use every day to figure out where the oil is because uh, we want to try to eliminate it as close to the source as possible. If we can collect it all there, then it's not going to get to the shoreline. So at the source, we've got our uh, most capable skimming vessels. Uh, this is uh, basically every fleet or every skimming vessel that was available in the Gulf. Uh, we're now pulling them down from uh, the Atlantic 
uh, the Pacific and we're reaching uh, across, the, across the ocean to get the, the skimmers that we need. Uh, we're, uh, we're bringing new stuff online every day to put them in, in the blackest oil, which is close to the source, uh, because it's the most efficient way to actually clean up the oil, because it's fresh, uh, it's recoverable. <clears throat> and then uh, further away from the source, then we're looking at uh, what we call um, alternate response technologies, uh, such as controlled burning, where we corral it and we burn it. Uh, that's been very successful for us. Uh, since there's a lot of space out there, we also have room for uh, aerial dispersants. Uh, so when we get permission to, to use those from the regional response team, um, we use dispersants out there as well. Uh, further in, we have uh, <clears throat> around the passes and cuts, uh, for instance, the Barataria Bay, uh, Grand Isle, Terrebonne, moving all the way uh, east and west into Louisiana. We have uh, smaller skim skimmers, uh, stuff that uh, really can't get offshore, but it's designed for inshore and nearshore skimming. Uh, for the stuff that does, uh, that does make it to, uh, to shore. And then we have a whole army of, of people uh, out there on uh, small boats, beach cleaners, uh, picking up the stuff that does get to shore. Uh, and numerous uh, techniques or strategies, actual tactics to, to get rid of the oil. Uh, one, uh, we try to prevent the oil from getting to the beach or the marsh or the sensitive areas. Uh, we use boom to do that. Uh, when it's uh, nice, calm days, it's very effective at doing that. Uh, but when we get the, the weather that comes through, it, it, it moves the boom all around and it's, it's very difficult to, to keep the oil um, uh, where we don't want it when the, uh, the weather affects it. So uh, in addition to just the boom, when we do have impacts, then we have uh, you know, manual recovery. <clears throat> and here you can see uh, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the projection of, of some of the impacts that we've had. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is the boom map, so you can see areas that we've boomed. And this is the, the latest projection of, of where we've seen uh, oil, uh, not necessarily recoverable oil. A lot of this can be sheen, but from our overflights uh, and the, the information that we get, uh, we're trying to predict where the oil's going so that we can be best prepared to uh, prevent it from getting on the beaches. That's the, the basic strategy. Source control uh, is out of Houston, but then we have source recovery, burning, dispersing, um, <clears throat> Further away, uh, leading edges recovery with less capable skimmers, and then uh, shoreline uh, defense and protection, uh, which is a whole slew of uh, different, uh, uh, different activities, from manual pickup of tar balls to uh, uh, throwing sorbents out and then letting them work the, with the oil and then collecting the sorbents. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, beach cleaners out there, like a, it's a big tractor that picks up the sand, washes the sand basically, and that's, uh, we're using that to, uh, to clean beaches. Uh, it's much more effective than, you know, one guy picking up a tar ball. Um, lots of issues out there, and that is very hot uh, in South Louisiana this time of year, so uh, we're trying not to get anyone hurt as we're picking up, uh, picking up these tar balls and cleaning beaches, changing, changing sorbents, and uh, uh, tending boom, replacing boom, and uh, moving boom around to where we think the, uh, the oil may, may go. So our job here is to support those guys out there. And we do that by mostly being on the phone all day long, talking to people. Someone has a problem, somebody can't get something done. Uh, our job is to uh, find a way to support that person that's, that's out there doing the job. How do you feel that all this is working? Do you... um, it's a very difficult battle to fight because most oil spills, you, you secure the source. Uh, so every day we're fighting like a new oil spill, uh, which is a challenge. I, I think the best people in the world are working here on this. Uh, and they're doing amazing things out there. We're, we're doing things that have never been done before. Uh, we're burning longer than they've ever invented boom that can actually be burned. Uh, we're exceeding the limits of all of our capabilities and, and learning as we go every day. It, it's a pretty amazing group of people that are out there doing this. Um, and we're not necessarily getting the credit for our successes because we get harped on and where we're not doing as good a job as we want to do. Uh, but there's an amazing cast of uh, literally thousands that are working, you know, 14, 15 hours a day uh, <clears throat> on this problem. Basically, this is the control burn unit. And as you can see over here, we have cameras on board all, of, all the vessels. We pan in and we can follow what they're doing. On, Real time. This is real time what's going on out there. And this is what we're doing is trying to capture the oil in the boom. We have two fishing boats pulling boom at a slow rate. And as the crude oil builds up in that boom, we'll send an igniter team over.
set the igniter into the boom, into the oil, and light it off, back away, and as that igniter gets, gets roaring, the crude oil will start to burn. Once it gets burning, it'll start propagating itself. There's a quantitative measure that they utilize to get how many barrels are being burned. We have a small uh, minimum amount and a maximum amount. So we try to take the, uh, the mean. We use air spotters. And they'll, come up, they'll come over approximately 1,000 feet, and they'll let us know exactly where the deep, darkest black oil is coming from, and that's what we'll go after. We'll, we'll radio that down to the boats. Well, on this one here, what we're doing here is charting where these boats are in relationship to the main, the main site. Mississippi 252. So the, the center of this is actually where the, the incident occurred. This is correct? the incident right here, uh -huh. correct. And it, as you can see, this is our task force right here. So anything around here where the oil is coming up, this is where we're capturing it. And all these vessels in here are all skimming. They're skimming the oil off. So what, whatever they can't get on the skim, we're trying to get on the burn. With these burns, about how far offshore are most of them taking place? They're going to be right at the site, and I believe that's 60, 60 miles offshore. Correct. So we're 60 miles offshore at, at the site, just around the site, because that's where the majority of the good burnable oil is. The uh, oil that gets dispersed or it becomes emulsified because of weather, it's hard to burn. We can't get it lit. So it has to be good black crude oil for us to get it burned. The only, the only thing that you may see happen on that is, is they may be looking at the smoke. You know, it does produce a lot of smoke. And that may be a negative to them. They see the air pollution. But as much crude oil as this thing is burning up, I think it's a positive. Because once it's burned, it's burned. It's done. There's you know, very little residue on this. You know, if we disperse it, uh, I think we spread it out. But if we burn it, we get rid of it. It's gone. So I think it's a good thing and especially if we get it right from the source. As soon as it comes up, burn it and be done with it. Hey, on safety. And somebody. Keep up the great work. Okay, keep, keep them safe out there. Thanks, Kev. Sending out. This is it. Just stick with it. Primarily what, what happens is, is when the field needs something, they send up a request, an order request. The order request goes through all these people in this room, and they basically identify it and purchase it and get it back to the field as quickly as possible. So that's what these people do in here. These, these gentlemen here in this table where you see the resources here, that's our, our alternative response technology evaluation team. That team is designed to look at all these different suggestions that people have, the public has, uh, the government has and evaluate those as far as whether they contribute to the uh, response or not. That's what they're doing. It's good stuff. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll talk about this room. This is sure. important. Okay, this room is our environmental unit. We have staffed here the world's foremost experts in oil spill science. We have representatives from NOAA here. We have some private industry folks. Uh, and this, their job primarily is to look at, A, what's the oil going to do to the environment? B, how, uh, how do we clean up and make sure that we're taking care of the environment? And I'd like to introduce Ms. Ann Haywood Walker. She's a veteran from the uh, Exxon Valdez <laughs> incident, and I've worked with her for over 20 years, and she's been actually one of my mentors and trainers. But oh dear. I just wanted to introduce Thank uh, you. you to them, and they, uh, they wanted to ask you some questions about your expertise oh. and your uh, experience with Valdez and what some of the comparisons are. The captain is too generous. <laughs> <laughs> just start with that. What would be some comparisons? Well, I would say comparisons are always a little tricky. Um, because there's so many variables in any oil spill. And so the setting of, of Alaska versus Louisiana is different. The oil is different. Uh, the quantity, even though it's kind of in the same order of magnitude, um, it's happening in a much different kind of environment. And so comparisons are difficult to do. And I think um, my rule of thumb, at least working on spills, is that you, the only generalization you can do with any validity is say that it, it depends, and it depends on all those variables. So there are a lot of good things that are on this bill uh, that, that help, I think, 
um, minimize some of the effects that, that we could see if things were different, if it were a different set of conditions. Can you talk about those? Well, I think, um, I think certainly the oil and the, and the warm weather and, and the fact that the Gulf of Mexico is a wide open body of water relative to Prince William Sound are all um, helpful things if you have to, you know, what you're trying to do is put, put this in the larger picture, the big picture, and, and uh, let people know that even though an oil spill is always, always a bad thing, that there are situations that make it better than it could be. What are you doing at HERO? We have a, a, a small group of technical specialists who are trying to assess dispersants and evaluate um, types of dispersants and, and uh, how much dispersants are being applied and factor that into the operational decision making as well as the, uh, the government agencies who have to decide kind of what's the best long-term plan for this bill. So when you hear all this concern about the dispersants, what do, you, what do you say about that? Well, I th again, I think it's something that's a little premature to make any judgments about. This is the uh, shoreline cleanup and assessment team, and this is the folks that are, are doing just that. They're, they're looking at the shorelines um, and a lot of the cleanup that's being done um, and really evaluating um, best strategies and uh, tactics to, to deal with that. And uh, Richard, Richard can certainly uh, give you an, an awful lot more about that. Hi, Richard. Hi. Hi. Do you want to come through? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I don't know whether I'm for you or not, but you're in the SCAT room now, essentially. And SCAT is all about assessing shorelines. Um, so everyone recognizes that some oil will come ashore, and when it does, we need to find it, assess what that means, decide what to do, and then clean it up. And that, in a sense, is what our team does. So we have teams in the field right now in helicopters, fixed-wing aircraft, um, on the ground, in boats, and walking shorelines. And what they do is they, they track and they document where the oil is. And they don't do the, the, the team that is doing this is a unified team, so it's part of BP. Um, we have people from the federal, NOAA and Coast Guard, and we have state representatives from Department of Environment Quality and other landowners and stakeholders. So we go out together, we find the oil, we document it expertly and consistently, and then we make decisions about what to do. So, for example, you have marsh areas around here, uh, we have riprap, we have sandy beaches, all sorts of different types of shorelines. And for each of those different shorelines, there are different cleaning techniques to achieve different results. And the critical thing here is to recognize what kind of shoreline types we have, what are the sensitivities, and how to clean them. And then we gather that data together, we put it all into um, technical instructions, and we get operations working to those instructions. And the final part of it is we then have our expert folks back out in the field monitoring what they do, make sure it's done, make sure it's done well and it's effective. Mm -hmm. So that's how we do it. And I can kind of show you the room sure. and, and so you can see exactly how it is. What I should say is all our folks are out in the field right now. Okay, So this is a very busy room at the beginning of the day, the end of the day and through the night because at the moment they're out gathering the data. So this is the quietest point. So if you look at that wall over there, essentially this is a big logistics operation. We have about five, six, maybe sometimes seven teams out in the air, on boats, on the ground. And we're deciding where they go, who's going with them, which state and fed representatives there are, and what are they going to go and document. Okay, so that is almost like the logistics, where is everyone at the moment? And then we have folks on the phones, on the radios, making sure that they stay safe and do things. When they come back in the field, from the field, they're at this desk, okay? So they're all set up, ready to go. They then discuss everything. So every day, all of the surveyors come back and we discuss exactly what we've seen. Because they've been trained and they're experts in what they do, they can describe in ways that can be replicated consistently so we all understand exactly what it is we're looking at. And then what they do is they, they put all the stuff together in documentation and stick it into a large database so that we can then generate all the reports and every day we come up with things like this. So this is a shoreline map, it's a cumulative current oiling map where we're showing areas of heavy pollution, medium pollution, light and also for the blue areas for example, no oil. So we know exactly where the oil is, how much is there, what does it consist of and then from that we generate what are we going to do about it. 
So that's essentially how we generate things. And then we go and work with the guys in the main room. I'm sure you're talking to the operations guys with the red jackets on. And they're out there in the field organizing. So if that's what we need to do, how are we going to go about it? And then what are our endpoints? One of the other things I should say is we have people from NOAA and Polaris who essentially were the architects of this process 20 years ago. So you need to be expert at what you're doing. So we brought the experts in to work alongside BP, plus all the local folks from Department of Environmental Quality, the Louisiana State Representatives, who are critical in making sure that what we're doing is absolutely the right thing to do. A, we do it right, but B, we don't cause any other damage. So the marshland treatments are the right ones. If there are wildlife sites of concern, that we address those rights. And that, for example, if there are archaeological sites that need to be protected, we keep people away from them. So it's the right approach for the right place for the right time. So those are the sorts of critical aspects of shoreline assessment that I, I just want to get across to you in one, one, one um, quick form. What about you personally? Are you uh, with BP? Sorry, I should have introduced you. Yeah, I, I'm from BP and uh, I, I've only worked for BP for about three years, but my background is crisis management. For the last 20 years, crisis management is all I've done, and oil spills specifically. So I'm based in the UK and I'm out of the corporate crisis headquarters. So I set policy and strategy for BP across the board of how they deal with all risks, whether it's a fire explosion, a flood, oil spill or whatever. Essentially, I, I'm one of the small team that determines how BP operates. And that's based on 20 years of responding to oil spills, basically, in about 26 countries all over the world. And I've trained and consulted in about another 10. So America is just one backyard I work in. And essentially, I've been pulled in to make sure that the shoreline response program is tight focused and it will deliver on what it does. So with the shoreline assessment, what is the biggest challenge? I think the, the, each week you get a different challenge. If you want to overall uh, give a summary of some of the challenges, A, firstly, just logistics. Getting folks out into a field from a helicopter to a to car to another truck to a boat to a, an airboat. It takes hours to get people somewhere to the most remote locations. Right now, if you want another key challenge, it's heat. You know, it's hot out there. It's, it's quite, there are significant logistic and safety challenges just to get to do your job. Um, I think that's probably one of the key ones. If you're talking about oil on shores and what are our challenges, it's the marshes. You have very sensitive marshland areas and contrary to what the general public might think, the best way to clean up a marsh is not to just go in there and start stripping it out and taking the oil out. Uh, marshes are very sensitive environments and you need to be very careful with that. So the biggest challenge is really getting people to understand that doing very little, flushing the oil out gently, taking care of the marshes, don't go trampling onto the vegetation, don't mix the oil in the sediments. Actually understanding that doing a little bit of effective work is much better than doing a lot of very ineffective and damaging work. And then if you contrast that to a sandy beach, you can go and clean a sandy beach very quickly. So in that case, the, the idea of go in and get it quick absolutely holds hard. So getting people to understand that just cleaning up oil is not just about going and scooping it up. There's a lot of expert work that needs to go into working out exactly which ways to do it and how best to go. Yeah, so, so this space in here, you see there's a lot of folks um, looking at a lot of data and, and what they're analyzing are health risks um, to the crews, health risks to the responders, um, and really looking at any safety um, and health concerns sort of response-wide. Um, you know, in any, in any situation where you've got a response, you've got a lot of people moving fast, a lot of people moving fast in short notice, you've got an element of, uh, of risk. Um, that's true on the land, and you add that, you know, you take that and you take that out at sea, and uh, you've got a tenfold risk factor. So there's a lot of folks devoted um, to looking at all that data, um, looking at how the crews are, are, are operating, looking at how the crews are doing business out at the, at the source, um, out within the response area, um, and, and assessing that, making sure that everybody's safe and that uh, we can continue doing the mission. Um, is a crew, crew health and um, you know, responder health is, is paramount that we can continue, uh, continue to be effective. This is our cafeteria and we're feeding between 750 and maybe 850 people a day in here uh, three times a day.
Among the services that we offer are laundry service. People are staying at hotels and motels all around the area, and you can drop your laundry off 24 hours a day, and as long as you get it here before 8 o'clock on any given day, you can pick it up uh, any time around the clock. Now, right now we're going uh, up to uh, where we have full-time, 24-hour day medical services available. We can, get a, we can get a glimpse in there, sure. If, if their door's open, it's not, so they've got folks in there right now. Air operations come from this office over here. So 24 hours a day, um, there are pilots totally linked up uh, with the with the system, able to deploy all the air resources, both uh, fixed wing and helicopter assets that are necessary out of the entire theater of operations. And any given day, we have as many as 125 uh, air ops uh, being directed out of this area. Incident commander office is there. Is this the, is this the BP incident commander? That's where Mike's office is. But it... This is the office of the uh, entire Unified Command. Um, a lot of Coast Guard folks in here and the other folks, including the state and federal agencies uh, who have a seat at the Unified Command table. We also have a spiritual side here. Um, EA, EAP means Employee Assistance Plan and Program, Employee Assistance Program, and we have a chaplain here. And so there are regular church services offered um, throughout the week. I've noticed that there are some trailers. Can you talk about that? Yeah, if you take a look outside and really sort of starting to dot around the perimeter of, of the building itself, you start to see a lot of mobile, um, you know, mobile command posts, we call them, a lot of trailers that are brought in. Um, you see a lot with the local police. Uh, the Coast Guard has a national strike force. They have a trailer set up. And there's also some that are being, you know, sort of constructed in. Um, you know, as we continue to grow as a unified command, um, the real estate has, becomes an issue. We really want to give our folks room to work have enough uh, dedicated desks, dedicated lines, dedicated phones. Um, as you can see with some of the rooms are really starting to pack in and as the unified commands beginning to, uh, you know, continuing to grow, we really want to give them room to grow out and, and have spaces to work in. <laughs> I'll look now at the effect the oil spill may have on Pensacola, Florida.